While in the synagogue of Nazareth on the Sabbath, Jesus began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So all were speaking highly of him and marveling at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, Is this not Joseph's son? So he said to them, No doubt you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. He continued saying, Truly I say to you, no prophet is ever welcome in his hometown, but I am telling you the truth. There were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, as a great famine came over the land. And yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them were cleansed, save only Naaman the Syrian. Then all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. And they got up and drove Jesus out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill which their city had been built on in order to throw him over the cliff. But passing through their midst, Jesus went his way. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to Jesus. Some things are added that just become one of the essentials over time. And we can hardly think of having a liturgy without a certain uh, practice or custom that is associated with that. The liturgy is what informs our prayers as, believer, uh, as believing people. For we pray in our own personal lives in the inner sanctum, in that secret chamber that Jesus refers to within the human heart where in our, the depths of our very being, the human spirit encounters the divine spirit. But that prayer that we have in our own personal daily lives is informed by the communal prayer that we share together every Sunday. And so we hear different words, and our liturgy is filled with sacred actions, rituals and symbols and signs, and these things all express to us one thing, the big story.
story, the big narrative that is behind all of reality. And it's only insofar that our individual story of our own life narrative is connected with the big story that we find any meaning in our own lives. So this is why liturgy is so very sacred and so very important to us, especially those Christians that are of the Catholic uh, tradition that we uh, participate in here at St. Matthew's. I say these things because as we are together in community and we say the words, ancient words, they have a power to transform us. And so we listen to these words uh, not so much with our intellect as we do with the depths of our heart. Because there is a language that goes beyond words, and it's the language of the heart. And it's that language that God speaks most constantly towards us. In the ancient world, centuries before the coming of Jesus, there was a phenomenon in ancient Israel as a whole class of people were raised up by the sovereign act of God. No one planned for this to happen. You don't go to school to get a degree to become a prophet. God just chooses a person to bear his message to the community. And so over the centuries, God raised up people like Isaiah and uh, Malachi and you can name Ezekiel. And, and this morning we heard from the prophet Jeremiah. These were the ancient Nebuchadnezzar, which we translate into our English word, prophet. These are human beings who were very ordinary, if you will. There was nothing very unusual about them. They were fully human, although some of them were a little strange. And uh, these men would have an ex and women, because they were women prophets, were overcome by the glory of God, by the Holy Spirit, and they were so overcome by this experience of the Holy Spirit that they would begin to dance and they would sing their oracles. So when you think of the prophets giving their message, they chanted their message. And it was a beautiful poetic expression of the human heart, especially in that context in ancient Hebrew culture. And some of the prophets would even submit their uh, prophetic oracles into writing. And in the first reading today, it comes from the first chapter of Jeremiah the prophet, in which we are told that uh, he was called of God, and that these are the words of the prophet Jeremiah. And when he gave his oracle, he didn't do it in some nebulous, timeless place, but it is hooked into real historical events because we're told in the opening lines of the book of the prophet Jeremiah that he gave this prophetic message in the 13th year of the reign of King Josiah. It is anchored in the historic, real, everyday experience of human beings. That is the context of his prophetic message. They were the words of Jeremiah, but the words of Jeremiah become the vehicle by which he expresses how God came to him. And we are told that the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying thus and so. This word of the Lord is not a text of scripture. This word of the Lord is not some idea that Jeremiah thought up. The word of the Lord is a person, a person that is the intelligence behind the whole created universe. The word was with God, and the Word was God, and at a certain point of history, which Jeremiah could hardly imagine, the Word would become flesh and dwell among us, and that Word was nothing less than the person that we call Jesus of Nazareth, who lived in history, in time and space, in a particular location, and he lived for a particular period of time. But this word, long before it became incarnate in the person of Jesus, had come to the ancient prophets. And so the word of the Lord is the source of the prophetic message. Every generation has its prophets. Every people have their prophets. The Hebrew prophets may stand in a, uh, in a category all their own. But God is in 
the world. He is present among the human race, and God is not silent. Ours is a God who speaks to us, who speaks words to us. And this is part of the reason why we are called the image of God. We bear the Imago Dei because we have this ability to enter into a relationship with God that is conversational. God is carrying on a never-ending conversation with the human race. So our relationship with God is, as some theologians call it, dialogical. That it is an engagement and an exchange and a dialogue and a conversation. So the word of the Lord comes to the prophet Jeremiah saying, From your mother's womb I have known you, and my call has been upon your life. And he wasn't just speaking a truth that had something to do with Jeremiah, although it did, but not uniquely so. God could say the same for each of you. There are no accidents. There are no human beings that are a mistake and should not exist. That God knows us from the moment we are conceived within our mother's womb. And the call of God is upon every heart and upon every human life. And life becomes a quest by which we discover that voice that is constantly whispering in our hearts and that we can somehow connect with that and hear God speak to us. And when we hear God speak to us, He calls us by name. He affirms our identity and He calls us to a mission. There was another prophet who came along. To us, he's the greatest prophet of all time. His name was Jesus of Nazareth. He had begun his ministry in a town called Capernaum, which was along the northeastern coast of the Sea of Galilee. He was living in the house of Peter. His mother, Mary, was with him. Maybe some of his other relatives were there as well. But that's not the town that Jesus was from. But that is the town, Capernaum, where he began that fateful ministry that would change the course of all of human history. He had gone from village to village, proclaiming the good news to the poor. He would gave sight to the blind, and he bound the broken hearts of all the people. He was a great healer, he was a great deliverer, and soon thousands were following after him. In the account today, as the gospel text opens, Jesus returns to his hometown, Nazareth. That's why he's called Jesus of Nazareth. He was from a village in the highlands, up in the hills of Galilee. Capernaum was on the Sea of Galilee, down in the valley, 1,250 feet below sea level, but up in the heights of Galilee, nestled within the green hills there, was the village of Nazareth, where Jesus spent 30 years of his life, living in obscurity. Can you imagine that? He was living in this village, and people that lived in the village with him Classmates and friends, uncles, aunts, relatives, friends, fellow, fellow villagers, the local rabbi, they knew Jesus. He grew up in their midst, but they did not recognize him. They had no idea just who it was that was living out that ordinary life, if you could call it ordinary, in their midst. And so now, their son, their favorite son, Jesus, comes home. And it's on a Friday evening, as the sun goes down, the Jewish Sabbath begins. And we are told that, as was his custom, he went to the synagogue. And people were marveling at Jesus. They heard all the stories and the rumors, and they were wondering, how can this be? This is Jesus. We know him. We know his father, Joseph. We know his mother. He grew up here. Where did he get all this knowledge? Where did he get all this eloquence? Where did he get all this power to do these works that are being attributed to him? This is not the Jesus that we knew. My brothers and sisters, he was no ordinary person, although they thought he was. And the fact of the matter is, my brothers and sisters, there's no such thing as an ordinary person. Every human being, every person,
that person that is sitting right next to you now is an extraordinary miracle of God. We have no idea the beauty of the, and the significance of the eternal being called a person that is sitting right in our midst. We think we know, but we know nothing. Only God knows, because God is the only one with the vision to pierce and to view the human heart. And so they asked Jesus to read the reading from Isaiah the prophet, from the Haftorah and the synagogue service, and he did, and he gave commentary. He said one line, today the scripture, which was a messianic prediction, was, is fulfilled in your presence. And they were startled, and they marveled at the eloquence and the grace of his words as they fell from his lips, the writer tells us. And then Jesus does something that all prophets do. They bring the necessary message. And it's not a feel-good message. Remember when jo Jeremiah was given his message to give to the people of Jerusalem centuries before Jesus? Jeremiah didn't want to give the message. He tried to restrain himself. I can't give this message. No one wants to hear this. It's not politically correct. It's not a popular message. But then Jeremiah says, but I couldn't contain the word of the Lord within me. My bones were burning and I had to speak. I was compelled to speak the prophetic oracle. And you know something? Jeremiah was quite right because when he gave the message to the audience that was listening to him in his own day, they hated him. They persecuted him. And they took him and they threw him at the bottom of a cistern. And he sank waist deep in the mud. Now, that is a very clean translation. <laughs> I want you to know that. You know, that they cleaned that up. Uh, because we read this stuff in church, you know. But they didn't throw him just in an ordinary cistern. I want you to know. I think you catch my drift. He was humiliated and he was rejected and he became the object of violence, such as it is for every prophet. Because prophets do not bring a message uh, that makes us feel good about ourselves. Prophets bring messages that challenges us and accuses us of our own injustice. It is a message that forces us to take an honest look at ourselves, and people don't want to do that. We rather live in our delusions and in our illusions than to see things as they really are. Because if we saw things as they really are, if we saw the truth about ourselves, the truth about our context, the truth about our community, we would go mad, we fear. We would have to change. We would have to do something different. And we don't like to change our ways. We don't like doing the different thing. We would rather fit in with, the, with business as usual. So Jesus now speaks the prophetic message. And he said, you know, in the days of Elijah the prophet, there was a famine in the land for three and a half years. They knew this story. They went to Sunday school. What did you say? They went to synagogue school. <laughs> And uh, they knew this story. But Jesus goes on to say, and there were many widows in Israel, the chosen people at that time. But Elijah didn't go to any one of them. He went instead to the widow of Zarephath, a Canaanite woman who was not even in the right group and didn't even have the right religion. And he went to her, and she was blessed. And there were many lepers in the days of Elisha, the prophet. But God didn't send Elisha to any of the lepers of Israel, but rather sent him to Naaman, the Syrian, who was a foreigner and an enemy of Israel. And Naaman the Syrian was the one who was healed. And when they heard these words, the crowd that was marveling at Jesus on one hand, wondering where did he get such knowledge, they tend to turn against him just like their ancestors just like anyone else who was confronted by the voice of the prophet, and they were enraged. They were challenged. Jesus was shaking their tree. He was tipping the boat, and they couldn't stand it. And so this nice crowd that was gathered, wearing their Sabbath best in church, very religious, good people, all of a sudden, that crowd was turned into a lynch mob. 
Because the word of the Lord has a way of cutting deep to the very heart of the human person. And they were angry and they were enraged. Just like the hearers of Jeremiah the prophet, so with this new prophet, Jesus, <coughs> was in their midst. You know, they say familiarity breeds contempt. <laughs> that a prophet is not without honor except among his own home people, in his own town, among those who know him. They knew Jesus, and yet they never really knew him. They had no idea that the Son of God was being raised within their midst, and they did not recognize it. And so in their rage, they lost complete control. All of the religious decorum and the proper way of behaving went out the window. And they grabbed hold of Jesus who was sitting down on the stone floor of that synagogue in Nazareth. And they yanked him up with the intention to kill him. One of their own. And they dragged Jesus out into the street. And they dragged him up to the brow of the hill. <coughs> I've seen it. I've been there. And they were going to throw him off. And the reason they were going to throw him off is because... They were going to stone him. This became a lynch mob. Their intentions were deadly. These were people that grew up with Jesus. They knew who he was. But they were possessed by their rage because they could not face the truth about themselves. And so they became murderous in their intentions. And the reason they were going to throw him from the brow of the hill because in the tradition of stoning someone, first, you threw him off a high point. And if the fall didn't kill them, then you would heap stones on them until they were dead. That was their intention. And they were just about to carry out their intention when suddenly, and the writer of the gospel does not explain why, they stop. And we are simply turned, told that Jesus turns. And I think he looks at all of them. And that he passes through the crowd as the crowd like the Red Sea parts to allow the Son of God by, and he went on his way. My brothers and sisters, the real tragedy of the story is Jesus never goes back to Nazareth. They had their opportunity. They reacted. They reacted to the ministry of Jesus like many react to the ministry of any prophet, and he walks away. What was so compelling about Jesus that stopped them from carrying out their hideous designs? What was there about the person of Jesus that could cause a, a crowd of people, a righteous crowd, to stop frozen in their places? I think St. Paul gives the answer in the second reading we have. It's because Jesus, my brothers and sisters, was the embodiment of this thing that we call love. Jesus was the embodiment of the love of God Love, which is the greatest power in all the universe, greater than death, greater than anything you can imagine, for it is the source of all that is. Jesus was the incarnation of divine love. And what is it about love? Well, St. Paul tells us about love. And he says to us, to even today, even as he wrote this letter to another faith community like ourselves, in Corinth, I will show you the way which surpasses all others. And it's really the only way. If I were to speak in the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I'm merely a noisy gong or a crashing cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and possess all knowledge, and if I have faith great enough to move mountains but have not love, I am nothing at all. And if I give everything I have to feed the poor, even if I'm totally devoted to social justice ministry, if I even hand over my body in martyrdom to be burned, but if I have not love, I gain absolutely nothing. If you don't have love, you don't have anything. But if you have love, my brother and my sister, you possess all things. For it's the only thing that has any eternal value. All your stuff, your bank account, your house, your cars, that is all passing away. It is dust. It is nothing. Love is everything. And what is love like? It is patient. 
It is kind. It endures everything. And this love doesn't take and keep a record of all the offenses people have committed against it. Love doesn't keep a data bank of offenses. Love forgives. Love hopes all things, endures all things, believes all things, and love never, ever fails. <coughs> and in the end, when it comes down to it, in this thing that we call life, my brothers and sisters, there is only three things that remain after all is said and done. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. May we, who have had the joy of the love of Christ poured out in our hearts, become like Him. May we become the incarnation at this time and in this place of love in our world. For when we do that, then we are living lives in conformity of, in, of who we really are, of conformity to that Imago Dei, the image of God, which he has placed within us. Because there are no ordinary persons. A person by definition is extraordinary. <clears throat> Shall we stand as we profess our faith?